These are weapons of war. They should not be on the streets. Mass shootings, the deadly epidemic that shows no signs of stopping. This can happen anywhere. The crisis keeps hitting home. Y'all ain't never had that sense of urgency. You ain't never ran for your life. From Chicago to Gary to Highland Park. You can feel the bullets going by. No one is immune from these senseless tragedies. You can't unsee the things you've seen. What will it take to stop it? Now's the time to galvanize this movement. We could cut gun deaths in half this decade. Tonight, we dig deep into the issues. It's sadness and it's anger. And search for solutions. Let's use our voice. We can't wait for them to catch up to us. It's a Fox 32 special report. We all deserve to live in a world where gun violence doesn't exist, and we can make that world happen. Mass shootings breaking the cycle. And it starts now. Good evening and thank you for joining us for this special report. I'm Anthony Ponce. And I'm Anita Blanton. It seems like gunfire erupts every day at events, schools, and in neighborhoods. The violence leaving a trail of traumatized communities. In this next hour, we are going to break down what is behind these mass shootings that are now becoming an epidemic. Are gun laws strong enough? How does mental health play a role? What to do when you see red flags? And of course, how to heal after processing these kinds of horrific events. The process is a long one. For some people, it could take years to recover. Our Dan Placco looks at the scope of the problem and the direct impact. Already this year, there have been more than 330 mass shootings in the United States, 23 in Chicago alone, as tracked by the nonprofit Gun Violence Archive, which defines a mass shooting as an event in which four people are injured or killed, not including the shooter. It's not an America that is the land of the free and the home of the brave when we don't feel safe going to the movies or walking down the street with our kids on a 4th of July parade and we have to fix that. The first of the year at a Kenosha sports bar, people ringing in the new year as shots ring out. Also in January, six people shot execution style inside a Milwaukee duplex, an armed robbery gone wrong. In February, 14 people are shot at a hookah parlor in Las Vegas. We have a total of seven patients. In early March, a gunman fires 60 rounds outside a Little Caesars in Chicago's South Shore neighborhood. Every day we get shot, I get so fat. A week later, gunfire erupts at a car show in rural Arkansas. Several children among the 27 people shot. In April, a mass shooting at an outdoor concert in Dallas kills one man and injures 16. The very next day, five gunmen shoot 18 people in a gang brawl in Sacramento. In northwest suburban Elgin, two are killed and four injured during an early morning attack at an apartment complex. On May 10th, there are two mass shootings in Chicago. Cell phone video shows a child running from the gunfire between warring gangs in the back of the yards neighborhood. Police displaying the assault rifle they recovered. And hours later, six people are shot in a drive-by in Jackson Park. Chicago's top cop blaming the court system for putting the suspect back on the street. This should be a person held in jail when we caught him with a gun. We continue to investigate this case as a hate crime. In mid-May, the nation is shocked as an 18-year-old white supremacist kills 10 African Americans at a grocery store in Buffalo. It was a horrifying scene. I've never heard gunshots like that that loud. Just three days later, another mass shooting in Chicago as a gunman opens fire outside a McDonald's in River North. I heard a round go off and I kept walking and I walked up and my baby was there shot. The difference maker in this time is those kids that are carrying the firearms. And then Uvalde. It's devastating because they were, they were almost done with school and they were barely starting their life. 21 students and teachers murdered in the second worst school shooting in U.S. history, sparking mass protests for tighter gun laws. No Yet the mass shootings continue in Philadelphia, at a workplace in Maryland, outside a nightclub in Gary, and on the 4th of July, a 21-year-old loner opens fire on a parade in Highland Park, killing seven and injuring more than three dozen. You could feel them. Like, you could feel the bullets going by. They're like... And 
the bullet hit her right in the face. The number of mass shootings has climbed steadily over the past four years, from 336 in 2018 to 692 last year. And while mass shootings have happened all around the world, it is largely an American phenomenon. America is the only industrialized country in the world that suffers this kind of violence. We have 25 times the kinds of violence with guns that any other industrialized country experiences in the entire world. A recurring question when these mass shootings happen, could tougher gun laws have prevented anything? The viewpoints on this issue are passionate and wide ranging. Well, we're joined by three professionals with extensive background on this topic. Uh, Eric Reinhardt is the Lake County State's Attorney. His office is currently prosecuting the Highland Park shooting. Mike Brown is a licensed Illinois firearms instructor, criminal justice teacher, and an Army veteran. And Kristen Zeman is a law enforcement expert and former police chief of Aurora. And she was tapped by the Justice Department to look into the school shooting in Uvalde. Thank you all three for being on the program. We really appreciate it. Thank you. All right, so this Thank is you. always such a hot button topic, and usually it's one of the first discussion points <laughs> after a tragedy. Yeah. So let's begin. Some of the guns used in these mass shootings were bought legally. So I want to start with the question, could tougher gun laws have prevented these killings? And Kristen, since you've been working and this has been top of mind for you for the last few weeks since Uvalde, I want to get your response on that question first. Oh, you start with the most complicated question uh, right out of the gate, and it is the most complex answer. Um, I'm not so sure that it was a failure of law. I believe that it was a failure of the implementation of the law. I think it was a failure of uh, red flag laws, uh, you know, not coming to fruition and not being acted upon. And, you know, we have uh, Mike Brown and also uh, Eric Reinhardt here as well. Uh, Eric, if you want to take this question, the same question, uh, we'll kind of go around the room first. Yeah, uh, obviously, I um, want to start by expressing my condolences to the family of the loved ones, a uh, family who lost their loved ones in this terrible attack. Highland Park won't be the same. Uh, I want to say that we are supporting all the victims on the ground, whether it's psychological or physical injuries and have to thank the first responders and police and, and counselors and FBI who are uh, assisting Highland Park uh, in this uh, very difficult time. Yeah, I think that I think we need different gun laws. I think we should ban assault weapons. I think we should ban high capacity uh, clips. I think we should uh, do more with our red flag laws. I think we should spread the information around uh, to prosecutors offices, for example, when there are clear and present uh, when there are uh, clear and present danger indications. Uh, it's all just spreading around the information. So I, I think it was, I think the laws uh, aren't strict enough when it comes to assault rifles or to high capacity rounds. I think we should have better background checks. I think we should have universal background checks. 90% of Americans believe in universal background checks. And we should have an assault weapon ban as we did from 1994 to 2004. Uvalde, Buffalo, El Paso, uh, Atlanta, so many of these were bought uh, legally and they were bought by, uh, by young people. We can't just expect a, a father or a mother to, to stop a loved one. They shouldn't have access to these firearms in the first place. And that was certainly the case in this most region, recent shooting in Highland Park. The firearm apparently purchased legally. Mike Brown, let's go over to you. You know, I, I tend to have a little bit of a different uh, spiel on this because uh, having been a first responder to a lot of incidents relative to this and teaching people about defending themselves, I don't believe that, you know, even if you do strengthen the laws on the books, you still have to deal with the person. And there's a lot of information that's out there from the United States Secret Service and the Violence Project that talked about the top four things that uh, were very instrumental in 50 mass shooters that they've studied. And the number one thing is early childhood trauma and exposure to violence. Guns and the tools to implement that desire is actually the very last thing that they address. If we don't address the family and a lot of the things that motivate the trauma, that motivate the, the, the uh, ex exposition, so to speak, of that trauma on that person, you can make all the laws you want, but you cannot criminalize ingenuity. And that's the one thing that is apolitical. You won't see politicians address that because if I tell a particular citizen that you might have to seek some counseling, you might have to fix this, and my seat is based on popularity, that's one less vote. I'm, I'll be the one-term politician. 
and you know, can I respond? Can I respond to that point? Sure, sure. I thought I thought Brian's answer was outstanding. Uh, I just don't know why I don't know why he's saying it's not political. It's a political decision about how much we invest in our mental health infrastructure. It's a political decision how much we support our local health departments and how much money we give uh, to treat people who need mental health counseling. And I love his answer about early childhood education. Uh, it's political too. How much money should we put into to into our schools? Uh, my parents are teachers. I've been thinking about education policy my whole life, and it leads to and it leads to my work in crime policy. So I agree. I love Brian's answer. I agree with Brian 100. percent And the last thing I'll say is I just don't think any of these solutions are mutually exclusive. And uh, I know we have a longer format today, but it really frustrates me when I hear uh, on other shows, not this one, uh, when I hear on other shows, people wanting to talk about one solution and then parse whether one thing uh, would have changed it. We need many solutions to this problem. Mm -hmm. I will agree. Uh, Attorney yes. Reinhardt, you've been vocal about that aspect of banning assault weapons. Uh, this has been an ongoing conversation, a very long-term conversation. So what do you think needs to be done differently to get to that level? Politically, uh, I think that people need to, I think people need to decide whether they want to try to save lives. Uh, and I think that they need to uh, forget the political consequences and go forward with what's in their heart. Uh, we had an assault weapon ban and it was bipartisan. As, as difficult as things are politically in our country, they were pretty difficult in 1994, too. And if there was bipartisan support, there was law enforcement support, and the studies show that that reduced uh, mass killings. We should go back to that to that assault weapon ban. Uh, I support uh, I support a recent proposal uh, by Representative Hirschauer, uh, House Bill 5522, that would do exactly that. Kristen Zeman, I spoke with one of the first responders directly after the Highland Park Parade shooting happened. And one of the things that was just kind of top of mind for him is he said this young person was able to fire off th almost three full 30 magazine clips in a matter of seconds. Uh, what he told me that day, it was the day after this happened, was no one should have that kind of firepower. Uh, it was a, weapons, a weapon of war is how he described it. Your response there with regard to this possibility of an assault uh, weapons ban. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm in full support of adding friction surrounding the purchase of weapons and the possession of these high capacity magazines. Perhaps if we limited magazines and rounds, that would be one thing. You know, and, and I want to go back is, you know, when I say that sometimes it's not a failure of law, is that these are, we are tripping over red flags in the shooting in Aurora. The shooter possessed the gun illegally. His FOID card was revoked because he had a felony conviction uh, for assaulting his girlfriend in another state. And so the states don't talk to one another. So when, when we talk about this being a complex issue, mm. well, we're not kidding here. There are many layers involved. And so the complexity surrounding getting your hands on a weapon uh, when you either are you meet that red flag criteria or one of the 11 deadly sins, um, then that should absolutely keep you from purchasing a weapon. But the problem is, is that there is a gap between that and it's falling on local law enforcement to say, okay, this person's void card was revoked, or there are some, th some threats here that, that perhaps have been made by the shooter. What are you going to do about it? And we're in that gap of, well, they haven't done anything quite yet, you know, to raise to the level of, of having been convicted of a crime but they really shouldn't have a weapon. And that's the space that we all need to meet in and to throw money towards and legislation towards is to develop these threat matrix so people can't get their hands on these weapons. Let's stay there on red flag laws. And Attorney Reinhardt, maybe we should come back to you on this. Can you just detail uh, what the red flag laws are for Illinois? And then I'd like to go over to Mike and see for you, do the FOID cards work in your opinion? Let's start with uh, Attorney Reinhardt. So there's really two tracks here. There's the ISP application process. That's one of the issues at, at uh, that's one of the issues in this case. The uh, the designation was sent by the Highland Park Police Department to the Illinois State Police, but the shooter here didn't have firearms that day. He didn't have a FOID card, and so it got a I think a I think it was treated differently by the Illinois State Police because there was no pending FOID application. Firearms weren't involved. So yes, the Highland Park Police Department did the correct thing in, in sending the notice. Uh, and I think that notice could go out to even more uh, law enforcement agencies, potentially. The Illinois State Police evaluated what they had, which was uh, a very disturbing incident about knives uh, and about threats. 
and they made the decision that they did, I'd refer you to them in terms of exactly how they made that decision. But that information wasn't later accessed, uh, my understanding, when the FOID application went through. That's one type of red flag law. The other type is the one I've been talking a little bit more about because it's in our courts, uh, which is the Illinois Firearm Restraining Order. You can Google that to find out about it. We have it on our website too. Illinois Firearm Restraining Order. It allows uh, family members and law enforcement officers to file a petition with your local court, just your county court, uh, where you make an argument to a judge to uh, take away firearms from somebody or to not allow them to purchase firearms. Uh, it's, a, it's a full proceeding, there's evidence, uh, there's an argument made to a judge and a judge makes a decision of whether an individual can keep their firearms or whether they should be able to purchase uh, new firearms. That's, I think, I really think both process, both processes, uh, procedures are something that we need to get more information out to the public about. Okay. Well, Mike Brown, let's get your thoughts on this. You've been on, around firearms uh, your entire career. Are these Illinois laws robust enough? <coughs> You know, it, the laws are some of the toughest in the country, and now we're talking about strengthening the laws even more. But one thing that has not been mentioned in any media platform is the fact, though, except for one media platform, that uh, Robert Cremo's mother, you know, when he before he was even two years old, she was charged and convicted without endangerment for leaving him in the car. The police responded 20 times between 2009 and 2014 for domestic incidents regarding their family. You know, uh, we, before, the FBI has a study uh, to, between 2000 and 2019 where they said, first of all, 11 uh, and 12 in the state is Illinois for active shootings, and then businesses open to pedestrian traffic are some of the highest targeted areas for active shooters. So please forgive me or indulge me uh, in, in latitude here, but I cannot let that information say that we did not know something like this was possible. You know, you have people who knew Robert Cremo and could say that he came from a troubled childhood. Those are all of the indicators, according to the Violence Project, the Secret Service, all of these indicators that state that this could have happened even Highland Park has a ban, Ordinance 6813, that says you're not allowed to have these assault weapons. This could have been preventable if you would have used the information that was readily present and had more volunteers to provide the high ground to cover these areas. We cannot ignore this stuff that's already present. Well, we thank That's you. Precisely, that was precisely my point, is that it's the failure of the implementation of the laws. And let's talk about culture, the culture of reporting. Um, at the Pratt shooting in Aurora at 9.30 that morning, that shooter declared that he was going to shoot the place up and had been known to carry a weapon because he talked about it all the time. Not one person reported it. The, the drum that I have been beating is that these shooters live either in your own house or in this case, in your basement. Uh, they live next door to you. They, they're in the next cubicle from you and there are red flags and yet no one is reporting them. And once we once we take those childhood traumas to, to Mike's point and, and you bring that into the th threat matrix, that is where the action or reaction happens. And that is where we need to focus our attention. Chief Zeman. Mike Brown, Eric Reinhardt, uh, state's attorney, we thank you all for your time. We know we could go on and on with this discussion, but we appreciate you. Uh, we're going to move on to a another aspect of this extensive uh, conversation now. Thank you all three. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. When these tragic moments happen, we ask ourselves so often, how could someone do this? The immediate response always seems to be, mental illness. Back in 2019, former President Donald Trump responded to two mass shootings saying mental illness and hatred pulls the trigger, not the gun. And after the Uvalde shooting, Texas Governor Greg Abbott said anybody who shoots somebody else has a mental challenge, period. So is it true? Is mental illness the cause for our explosion of mass shootings? 
Well, joining us now is Lori Post, director of the Center for Health Policy and Economics at Northwestern School of Medicine, and Dr. Nancy Zars, a forensic psychologist who has served as chief psychologist at two federal prisons. Uh, there's been a lot of research on this particular topic. It comes up really each time we have a discussion about gun violence. So uh, I'd like to ask how often it is that mental illness is actually diagnosed in these gunmen. Yes, the Secret Service does reports on mass attacks in public spaces, and their most recent report, 2020, which reflects data from 2019, identifies that about 46% of attackers have symptoms of mental illness. Why do you think there's such a misconception, though? I mean, when we talk about uh, gun violence, obviously, when, when you mention mental illness, not every person who has a diagnosed mental illness is going to take this route. Yes. In fact, 90% of those people with mental illness are not violent, which means that only about 10% of people with mental illness are. And there, we're typically talking about the severe symptoms like hallucinations and paranoia and, and persecutory ideation. As for why I think there's a misconception, I, I've actually given this a lot of thought because I bounce up against it every single time there is some kind of mass casualty violence. I think part of it is people really don't understand mental illness and they really don't understand this kind of violence, so they think that they must be connected. Right. Then that is compounded by the fact that TV and movies and quite frankly, the news often present a strong link, or at least they suggest a strong link between mental illness and violence. And so over time, people believe it. Mm, yeah, right. I, I, has anything that you're seeing over and over uh, starts to get in your mind as well. Uh, it sounded like, Lori, you wanted to add to that? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, normal people without, um, that are not hostile anger or have, that have empathy cannot fathom killing somebody that's unarmed or children or anything like that. So therefore they attribute it to mental illness. And again, that only stigmatizes people who have mental health issues. And a lot of times it's not really a mental health, um, um, you know, illness, but more like what I would call a personality disorder, like being a psychopath, sociopath narcissistic, something like that. Mm -hmm. And Lori, a firearms expert uh, that we just spoke with mentioned early childhood trauma as being an issue in these shootings. Oh. We've spoken to it before. Do you think that that's a contributing factor? Yeah, I think that um, there's a guy from the behavioral analysis unit, Jim Clementi, and he says that genetics loads the guns, personality and psychology, aim it, and your experiences pull the trigger. Most people that have um, negative experiences as children don't grow up and become mass killers or serial killers or any kind of killers. Um, so but that doesn't explain it all. I mean, I think it's a combination of your genetics, your psychology, your personality, and anybody with more than one kid knows that you have a couple of children, same parents, same family, everything the same, but they have very different personalities. So part of it's just personality and part of it's genetics and part of it is experiences. But it comes up, I think, in a lot of legal cases that you know some, you can use that as a part of your defense, early childhood trauma, and some you can't. It, let's, let's suppose somebody has a diagnosis of a mental health like depression or anxiety. Um, that doesn't mean you're not culpable for massacring a, a bunch of unarmed people. You're not defending yourself. You're being aggressive. You're going out. You're intentionally um, trying to kill as many people as possible. You're responsible for that behavior. Most people um, that I have looked at since 1966 have um it, only a handful, I would say, would qualify as like criminally insane, where basically they don't understand what's going on, where they're having really hallucinations. Mm. And Dr. Zars, what do you think are some of the triggers for violence like this? Well, there's a number of triggers. And, and what triggers do is they increase the likelihood of acting out violently and or they strengthen the commitment to that, to that, to that violent plan. So triggers can include recent failures, it can include financial difficulties, it can include worsening mental health or psychosis, it can include anger management issues, it can, it can include loss, it can include a sense of grievance that, that might be internal that, that other people would not agree with. And I think the value of looking at triggers is if we can learn to identify those triggers early and intervene before they result in violence, 
we can do a great deal to, to reduce the amount of violence in our society. Yeah, how do we address triggers when you see so many uh, in these cases of uh, people who have planned methodically uh, these acts of violence for quite some time, though? So I, I was just going to say, I look at those, I just did a look right now from a quick one through 2016 through 2022, and I believe you can't really pick out triggers. And so out of the mass shooters um, from between 20, 2016 and 2022, I see that um, a a big pattern of they failed to launch the developmentally stunted. So like 92% live with their parents in the basement or a relative. Um, then 8% um, live um, independently, but have a parent paying for them. So 0% of them are taking care of themselves. 0% um, of them are in school. 85% of them are um, have a job, but they work for something related to the family. They're just not able to get a job on their own. And then about 40% of them purchased a, a, a mass shooting assault rifle right before the, the massacre itself. So that's a sign. And about 70% brought an assault rifle to the massacre. So owning an assault rifle is a risk factor. And pretty much 100% of them had no friends or close relationships. So I think that we have to look at ongoing um, patterns of alarming, disturbing behavior. And it's not a single event. So for example, some kids who don't have friends or don't appear to make form relationships that could be uh, they could be on the on the autism spectrum, um, and then people who have um, anger, hostile conflict, all you know all the time. A single event is one thing, but an ongoing pattern of it, and then prior contact with the criminal justice system, or getting in trouble at school when they were in school before they dropped out or before they finished school, um, and then also the family is perceiving it as is um, they refer to it as mental health behavior when it's really angers of anger issues or hate, issues of hate. Let me circle back around to uh, a piece of one of the things that Dr. Zars talked about uh, early on in our discussion. You mentioned the media playing a role in this, and I think it's an ongoing conversation for us in newsrooms about um, how to thoughtfully convey what's going on and at what point to uh, pivot from things and what do we show, what do we not show. Uh, what do you suggest, honestly, uh, for the media in terms of not influencing copycat behaviors with extensive coverage when we're also trying to convey the information that's needed? So I think that the, what can be harmful is when we romanticize either the perpetrator or the violent act, or when we give a voice to that perpetrator. With decorum and with respect, I think the media can play an important role in terms of informing the public, maybe giving a voice to the victims, yes. and then helping us learn from these events so that we can prevent future acts of violence. Right. And I completely agree with Dr. Farsi, and that, that is that um, the mass shooters, what drives them is they want to be, they want to gain fame and notoriety for killing as many people as possible. So don't give them a forum to do that. Never refer to their names. Don't give them a title. Um, never humanize them. And so what we see is all these nuanced stories about mass killers. And then we know nothing at all about subject, victim number one, two or three. We treat them as like clinical non-humans. So it's more important to humanize the victims and to make it very clinical and to not give voice or give a public forum. And we do know that um, mass shooting, is, it serves as a contagion and it's social media and the and legacy media, such as the news, the radio or whatever, that gives voice to these mass shooters that inspire other mass shooters. And we know that this inspires them because uh, new ones write about it. Frequently, they'll admire them or talk about they want to exceed their kill count, things like that. So don't give them a voice, don't give them the opportunity, and don't humanize them. And lastly, what can we all do to reduce the risk of violence? I'd like each of you to answer that. We'll start with you, Lori. Oh, well, I did a study that um, is similar or the same findings as multiple studies, and that is that if we have a federal assault weapons ban, it works, and also a ban on large capacity magazines. And I found that during the ban, we eliminated 11 public mass shootings during the decade that it was in place, which was 94 to 2004. And if we had kept the federal assault weapons ban in place between 2005 and 2019, we would have avoided an additional 30 mass shootings that killed 339 people and injured over 1,200. 
So and we don't have to look for some secret thing about what what motivates them. We don't have to screen them. We know that they need a gun. And I just gave you the stats also about showing how going to buy that assault rifle is like the last act, one of the last acts before they commit the mass shooting. Hmm. Okay, Dr. Zars. Well, I would like us also to focus on like a, a violence prevention program. We know that that this kind of violence is planned and, and purposeful. So these people go through a pathway to intended violence. Mm -hmm. So it is really helpful to educate the public, whether it's schools, whether it's workplaces, whether it's, it's houses of worship, as to what this pathway looks like so that we can inform people about the behaviors, about the warning signs, and about this pathway so that people report their concerns. Then we need to make sure that we have qualified professionals to assess that risk of violence. Then we need to make sure that we have effective programs to, to reduce that violence and to intervene in those cases. I really like ending our conversation at this point on on that note about educating um, the community, really. You know, all of us doing our part, uh, that includes us in the media, um, all of us doing our part to figure out how we can reduce the risk for everyone because it affects us all in the end. Thank you so much um, to Professor Post and also to Dr. Zars for being here with us and sharing your expertise. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. After these mass shootings, we all wonder, could they have been prevented and were there signs? Oftentimes, the clues were hiding in plain sight on social media. In Highland Park, the alleged gunman posted thousands of videos and images, many of them depicting people dying. And in Buffalo, posts revealed a suspected shooter had maps of the grocery store and planned the attack for months. So how did these red flags go unchecked? And joining me now are three guests with direct involvement in tracking this type of content. Aurora Crisis Intervention Unit Investigator David Guevara, Sergeant Jim Yonacek oversees the crisis outreach and support team in Lake County, and retired Internet Crimes Investigator Rich Wistocki. Thank you all three for being here. I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Jim, I want to start with you um, and just ask, why do we see, it seems, that we see the red flag so clearly after a tragedy like this, but not before an attack necessarily? The spotlight is obviously on it at, after the fact. Uh, 2020 vision clearly shows you uh, what you're looking for. Prior to that, uh, it involved takes a lot of involvement from folks to see something, say something. And that's a lot of what we're trying to put out there. Is the message to get out to the public. If you see something, uh, we, we hear the Chicago police say that all the time in the physical world, but you're saying this needs to happen online as well. Correct. Rich Wistocki, let's go to you. Flagging content, violent, dis disturbing content at first glance might seem kind of straightforward, but what if you're a parent, you're worried about your own child's posts? What's your message there, Rich? So first and foremost, we always say that parents are responsible for their kids' technology, right? And so many kids see this. The Secret Service did an amazing threat assessment survey in last year in 2021 where over the last 20 years, they found that 75% of the people who do these mass shootings post what they want to do before they do it. So we go into schools throughout the country and we train parents and students that if you see something, say something, and we show them when it comes to gaming online and social networking, no one online is anonymous. So we take that information, we do a two-day training class for um, school officials, and law enforcement together. They're there together on the first day. So they know what's possible. So we take that information and then I show law enforcement exactly what the protocols are according to the Electronics Communications Privacy Act. And we can get the information on the poster immediately. And then we can go ahead and execute search warrants on their homes, on their computers at home, on their cell phones and on their social networks. Once we do that, we will know that person's deepest, darkest secrets. We'll be able to check for weapons and get that person the mental health help that they need in order to stop school shootings. David Guevara, let's go over to you. Your unit is directly involved in that kind of intervention with law enforcement. Will you kind of walk us through uh, what happens when there is a uh, red flag online, an individual uh, posting disturbing content? 
So generally, it always is going to start with a 911 call or somebody coming to our police department to make the report that they saw something that was disturbing. A lot of it could be, I'm going to come and um, do X, Y, and Z at the school, or I'm going to come to the workplace, something along those lines where they there's this threat, somebody is now notifying law enforcement, and then so that's going to start the investigation. Uh, with our unit primarily is to try to, to have that intervention with that individual, but a lot of times it's not just working with that individual, it's trying to work with their family to get them the help that they need. Jim, let's go up to you. What if there is no 911 call? Again, see something, say something, but as far as if there is no 911 call, um, there's always some something in the background. Um, this is where with what we do in Lake County, Crisis Outreach and Support Team, we're trying to, as soon as we get a call in regards to a possible mental health issue that one of, one of our deputies might come across or an officer of one of the participating groups, uh, we're trying to follow up on that before it gets to be a bigger problem. Um, if we can interject ourselves and interject assistance in early enough, then they get the help and it's not an issue for law enforcement, it's not an issue for the community. And your unit uh, launched this kind of approach, I understand, in 2018. Jim, uh, run us through uh, just how many individuals your unit has had contact with uh, and intervened in some way. Since 20, September of 2018, we've had contacts with just over 3,200 folks. Uh, some of those are multiple contacts. Uh, our program is purely voluntary. So we are there if someone wants the assistance. Um, none, of, none of this is forced. Of those 3,200, approximately 2,000 have gone to the hospital for further immediate follow-up. Um, we follow up with them even after the fact to offer assistance either through the health department, through other services. Uh, there's a multitude of different services that we've been exposed to now that we can at least offer to folks. Um, again, it's we've got about a 73% follow-up rate as far as making contact with folks. Um, of those 3,200 contacts, only 42 have actually arrested, mm -hmm. resulted in an arrest. Um, the rest have been able to be addressed through other means and you know whether it be uh we have the health department nurco we have the living room wellness center up here uh catholic charities nicasa you know there's a multitude of different uh services that we can refer people to and again we don't you know we don't force someone to do it so it's purely voluntary i've had folks that six months after we've had contact with them they call us back and they say is this is that still an option and we say yes we're always here that's uh, really remarkable that you've had contact with so many individuals. These uh, could be, would be violent offenders that uh, are actually getting some treatment uh, via your unit. Rich, let's go to you. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you're able to, in, in many situations, identify the exact individual who is posting these kinds of threats. But I know that it gets tricky in the virtual world where people can hide their identity in many cases. How do you approach those situations? Oh, without giving away God. Uh, uh, investigative secrets. Um, you know, people a lot of time they use VPNs. Uh, they try to do things that will try to, to hide themselves. We can bend, penetrate VPNs. Uh, it's very easy. We have great relationships with social media and the gaming platforms. And, and again, it's just about knowing where to look. And the protocol is all there, Anthony. It's, it's just a matter of showing schools and law enforcement you know, what we do at the Internet Crimes Against Children level of our investigative process, bringing it down to the school level and holding their hands and showing everyone if you know that if you are in someone's social media, you will know their deepest, darkest secrets. Mm -hmm. And most of the time, kids who who make these veiled threats, they are just kidding. But who's going to take that chance anymore? Right. So I always tell my investigators that I'm training and my school officials, we must compare everything that comes through to Parkland. With the amount of mistakes that were made in Parkland, we never wanna make any of those mistakes. So we have to dot our I's and cross our T's and do what's appropriate, follow the rule of law and the ECPA to make everyone safe.
before something bad happens. David Guevara, sadly, followers of online content, it's not rare. Rich just mentioned the gaming aspect of this. So we gotta ask, are social media platforms playing a role in radicalizing these mass shooters? And if so, what do these platforms need to do to improve the situation? I can't speak specifically to the, to the I mean, there's such a multitude of content creators out there. There's also the video game platforms and then the social media platforms. A lot of them, I think, do a really good job of making it accessible to report content and then for the uh, platform to make a notification to law enforcement. I think Rich kind of touched on that as well, that we have a good relationship with a lot of these uh, networks to try to get notified. So um, I, if there's something that pops up, um, it's really has to, it's usually user generated. I'm not exactly sure how the platforms work and, and trying to maybe filter that out on their end. Uh, but I know that in terms of making reports to law enforcement, um, there's always something that that, that uh, most platforms have, like Facebook, Twitter, TikTok. In many aspects, it still feels like it's kind of the Wild West when it comes to social media and flagging these problematic individuals. Rich Wistocki, uh any thoughts there on things that social media platforms could do uh, to improve the situation? Yes, Anthony, so there is already set up um, something called the cyber tip. So every social network, gaming platform, and um, cloud service in the United States is already connected to the National Center of Missing and Exploited Children. They will report grooming, they'll report child sexual abuse material, they will report um, any type of hacking, things like that. But I've never seen a report come in as far as threats or school shooting. That goes directly to the FBI. Mm. So I think we need to open up the cyber tip line a little bit when it comes to violence and make them uh, through Congress because they already they already report uh, sexual exploitation to the National Center. I think we start we need to start including violence and select a government entity to take care of that violence that comes through their servers and uh, be more uh, proactive in doing that. All right, gentlemen, that is where we're going to have to leave the discussion. David Guevara with the Aurora Crisis Intervention Unit, uh, Jim Yunichek with Lake County, and Rich Wistocki. Always good to have your perspective. We thank you all for being here. Thanks, thank Anthony. You. I have failed you as a mother, bringing you into this world of such unpredictability. I am raising you in a world where I try and take you to parades and I try and cre create beautiful memories that I was blessed to have but now I'm just too scared to do any of it a raw testimonial from Highland Park mother Heather Reddish. She recorded the message for her daughters one day after fleeing from gunfire with her seven-year-old at the 4th of July parade. Her words striking a chord with parents everywhere who no longer feel safe going anywhere with large crowds. And she is not alone. Uh, some sobering poll numbers from the American Psychological Association. 79% of Americans surveyed said that they are stressed over the possibility of a mass shooting. And 33% say fear keeps them from going to certain places or events now. And that is one third of people polled truly living in fear. So it begs the question, how do we heal? And do you ever truly heal and recover from these kinds of terrifying events? We are joined by Heather Reddish, the Highland Park mom who made that viral post, child psychiatrist Dr. Louis Krauss with Rush University Medical Center, clinical psychologist Dr. Paul Smiley, and Rachel Jacoby, a Highland Park student who has coordinated several marches after mass shootings. We Thank you all for being here with us and joining us to talk about this very important topic. Uh, we're going to start with you, Heather, because we were just listening to your words um, that have struck a chord with so many people. You were at the parade. You had to run with your daughter to escape the gunfire. How are you and your family doing? We want to know that most of all. Thank you for asking. Um, we're okay. Um, I would say that this is definitely a healing process. Um, and one that um, I wasn't actually expecting to, I think, 
the, the world seems to be moving forward in some capacity and I'm a little stuck, if you will, in, um, in that actual event. And uh, the feelings, I think the first week was a lot of feeling numb and then the second week has been more feeling the feels and um, just trying to process and not replay the event over and over again in, in my head. And um, so, but my girls are, um, my daughter that was there with me, um, she's resilient and, and doing quite well and had some interesting questions to ask, but um, allowing her the time and, and effort to also process and heal. But thank you for asking. We're doing as good as can be expected. Such a challenge there. So mm -hmm. let's get to some of these professionals and address different levels of trauma, like the trauma that Heather and her daughter surely are experiencing, along with everyone in Highland Park. Uh, these folks directly impacted by this event as a witness or someone who lost a loved one, um, talking about what recovery and the healing process looks like. Uh, so, Dr. Smiley, let's start with you. Uh, your uh, thoughts on uh, folks who are in Heather's position and a seven-year-old uh, so young, what, what advice do you you have for folks who are in uh, that situation? Well, I can say I'm, I'm, I'm one of them. I've got a seven-year-old daughter myself, and, uh, you know, it, it prompted us to have conversations, even as a psychologist, I wasn't really ready to, to have with my kids. Um, it forces the, you know, uh, parents to feel nervous of wondering, am I what am I doing that's right? What am I doing that's wrong? Um, how should I be approaching my, my own kids? Um, recovery, as Heather had said, it, it is a staged process. It's not something that, you know, the, the trauma happens quickly, but the recovery does take time. And we have to kind of be patient and listen to our kids and, you know, be, be attentive to some of the signs that they're, that they're showing. Um, kids of younger ages uh, may not always you know, show this show signs in the same way. There might be some regression. Um, falling asleep might be a little bit more difficult. Um, security might be, you know, kind of a question of asking, can I hold your hand? Can I have a lovey? Um, can you fall asleep with me? They might, you know, wake up throughout the night and there might be some of these patterns, which ideally we want to help um, help kids of younger ages um, be reminded that as parents, it's always been our job to keep you safe. Um, even in times that, like this mass shooting, we didn't know what was going on in, the, in that moment of you know, panic and fear, but the reassurance to our kids that it's our jobs, it's our responsibility as mommies and daddies, as grandparents too, to ensure that every generation beneath us, we're always looking out for everybody else. It's the reasons why we say, don't do that, stop this, that's hot, don't touch. From a young age, we've all, always been giving our kids these verbal cues and sometimes, you know, uh, uh, other directions to help keep them safe. And this is what we're doing in these times right now. It's giving the extra hug. It's taking the patience, you know, to, you know, in, in calm, soothing voices to affirm safety and to listen to our kids cues of what they feel comfortable re-emerging with you know uh the first time to take a bike ride out of eyesight again the first time to you know grab ice cream with uh friends the first time to go back to the soccer fields and baseball diamonds uh to begin recovery in that process of what life felt like just before this mass mass shooting um and to help reclaim and to you know end up feeling as if we're not running from our fears. Dr. Krauss, let's go over to you. Uh, your advice for folks who are in Heather's uh, uh, position and other folks uh, who are dealing with a certain amount of PTSD following this event. Yeah, you know, there are a couple comments in regards to what people have already said. One has to do with resiliency. Uh, different people are gonna have different reactions to what occurred. I, I think though that uh, not enough emphasis is being placed on the parents. And parents need to be aware. What's the most important thing that was just described uh, for a parent is to keep their child safe, all right? They're put in a horrific situation where it was impossible to guarantee their, their child's safety. It's gonna leave you with a scar and with fear. Uh, and a parent needs to, over the next few weeks, see how they're doing. They, they need to see whether or not they're, they're having PTSD symptoms that are continuing. Uh, anything from you know poor sleep, 
nightmares, a fear of going to events, like what was already described, going out, letting your kids go out, going to open events, going to a park, going to the beach, anything like that. Um, recurrent memories, you know, the, that construct of, of thinking over and over again, and for some in the most severe state, even uh, feeling as though they could be reliving the event, they need to be able to get help. Uh, sooner rather than later. There's incredible community support here. I think people have relied on their families, their neighbors, and their community as a whole. And, and that has been unbelievable. You know, if I'm also from Highland Park. You, you walk around the, the city, you, you see this all over High Park Strong. And, and every time you see that sign, you know that there's somebody that, that cares. Incredibly important. But people also need to know uh, when they need to get professional help. Uh, you know, just like when you're on an aircraft, right? you got to put the oxygen mask on yourself before you can help your children. And, and you want to make sure that you're doing okay because your kids are going to pick up. Even if your kids are doing better or improving uh, or, or perhaps don't even need therapy, which is a, a distinct possibility for many, uh, they're going to pick up on how you're doing as a parent. And, and you need to be keenly aware of that. Uh, Dr. Krause, let's stay with you here and talk a little bit more about PTSD. Uh, you talked about uh, knowing when you need to get help. Now, I've spoken with um, you know men and women who have gone overseas to war and heard about some of the things that triggered them in the aftermath. What are some of the things that you think uh, could trigger people uh, trying to move forward in their own recovery following a mass shooting or really any of these shootings taking place even here in Chicago? It's, um, you know, getting back to normalcy, getting back to the point that you're going out. Uh, nobody's going to know for sure what, what might trigger them, what might cause uh, PTSD symptoms, worsen PTSD symptoms. Uh, some will get out and being able to, to do something like getting out to an open place and not having symptomatology will be incredibly helpful in the healing process. Uh, for others, they're going to see symptoms. They're going to find themselves limiting what they can do. And, and those, those are the points when those symptoms are impacting you to the point that you're not functioning as, as you typically should is when you need to get additional mental health support. Rachel Jacoby, I want to bring you into the conversation and talk about uh, how you are using activism as part of your own healing process and how folks are, are, are becoming involved in your efforts. How much has uh, these marches uh, and these events that you have organized, not only before uh, the Highland Park Parade shooting, but in the wake of them, how is that uh, helping you personally? I think, like a lot of us, I've had a lot of feelings following the July 4th shooting, and they've been coming in waves, and I haven't always known how to deal with them. But what I do know is that I want to make sure that all of the pain and the trauma that we experienced in Highland Park doesn't happen again. And that's spurred a lot of my activism and a lot of the activism that's been happening locally here in Highland Park, because no community should experience this tragedy because the type of gun violence we're seeing is preventable. So what's been healing for a lot of the community has been to be able to turn the hurt and the anger and the sadness that we're all feeling into hope, into activism, into advocacy, to pass safer gun laws to make sure that the tragedy that happened here in Highland Park doesn't happen anywhere else ever again. Uh, and those are uh, poignant words from you, Rachel. I want to go kind of around the room here on this last point, and we'll start with you, Rachel, because you uh, may just kind of reiterate what you just said there or expand upon it. Um, what's the one piece of advice you can give people working to process their emotions and heal from the violence? We'll start with you, Rachel. I think. I would say to lean into your feelings. Everything that everybody's feeling is really valid, and you need to let those feelings guide you to action, whether that action is calling your state senators and demanding that Illinois pass an assault weapons ban, whether it's joining a local march, whether it's hugging a neighbor or a friend or checking in on your loved ones. I think it's one thing that Highland Park has done is we've, as we've been healing, we've been healing together and we've been helping each other, and that's what I want to continue to encourage folks to do. Dr. Krause? Uh, in a similar vein, uh, you know, spending time with one's neighbors, uh, so helpful. 
Uh, but I also, I, I firmly believe that, that one needs to, as soon as possible, try to get back to a sense of normalcy. The longer you put that off, the harder it's going to be and the more likely you're going to have symptomatology that you're going to need additional help for. The quicker you can get back to some sense of normalcy, uh, the better off uh, you and your family will, will be. Dr. Smiley. I encourage people not to not to move away or let fear win when you feel that it's right and appropriate for you with the support of a friend, a loved one, community members. Um, understand what your fears are and conquer them. Um, if it means for some going back down Central Central Avenue, um, taking a moment and actually letting your emotion go. You can be very surprised with what has been um, suppressed and what you have just put aside, especially for the parents out there as your focus has been on your kids, to be able to actually have that like let down moment and just you know, just unfiltered, um, not a, you know, ashamed at all of the feelings that you're feeling. Um, I took time myself on Central Avenue recently and you know, if people see you crying, you know, in Central Avenue, they they get it. It's unspoken. There's a sense of community and understanding what the sense of loss, uh, grief. Um, and it's not just grief of people, but it's grief over our sense of safety, grief over our sense of community. You know, downtown Highland Park is the iconic, you know, area where that Port Clinton Square map is. That should be filled with, like, music and laughter. And I know we're going to get back there as a community. Um, and I'd encourage people to find your own path, you know, to, to get back there, leaning on the strength of the community, our friends, uh, priests, rabbis, um, to really understand that it's not just from, you know, spoken professionals, but it's from everybody else, you know, from, from our neighbors, from going to vigils, to visiting the memorials, um, to checking in with family, uh, you know, and anybody who continues to say, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, see if there's a way to break through that and just say, are, are we really, or what is it that is, you know, kind of kind of going on and just letting people know that you're you're here is a listening ear because so much of the healing process isn't what's said it's what's what's heard and heather we'll uh, go to you now i know this is still so new and fresh for you but has anything worked for you that you would give as a piece of advice for others i can't tell you that um every single friend and family member who just texts me checking in thinking of you just those little little you know pieces of, of love and communication to me just has been going a really long way. And, and I am just eternally grateful for the support of my friends and family and my Highland Park community because um, we are definitely Highland Park strong. So i um, grateful to be a part of that community for sure. All right, I think that's a great place to uh, leave it. Heather Radish, Dr. Uh, Louis Krauss, uh, Dr. Paul Smiley, and Rachel Jacoby, thank you all for being here. Thanks, Thanks yeah. for having us. And this is just a small part of a much larger conversation, one that we hope is playing out in cities all across America as we all try to do something to stop the cycle of mass shootings. We certainly hope that each of you have learned something from this, taken something from this tonight. We thank you for joining us and thank all of our guests who made this very important discussion possible. Stay strong and stay safe.